think we'll go ahead and start. Uh, so thank you for, for coming to the last I for Energy, or last of the semester, I for Energy talk of the fall. We'll start back up on February 1st at noon, so the series will continue on Fridays at noon next semester. Uh, let's see, I'd like to introduce our speaker, Eric Larson, is a senior PhD student at the University of Washington with expected completion in April, so congratulations and ahead of time and good luck with that. He received his Master's of Science in Electrical Engineering from Oklahoma State University in 2008. He is advised by Schwatek Patel in the Laboratory of Ubiquitous Computing at the University of Washington. His dissertation focuses on signal processing and machine learning that support sustainable water use, and he is working on semi-supervised modeling to make the designs practical. The tools that he is currently developing could be used by many others who are non-experts in machine learning. He has a broad range of interests, including research in image processing, optimization, technical HCI, and most recently, sensing markers of health from mobile phones. So with that, please join me in welcoming Eric. Thank you, I appreciate it. Um, so this is on, everybody can hear me? Great. Um, so as you mentioned, my, uh, my name's Eric Larson. I'm a PhD student at the University of Washington um, in the School of uh, Electrical Engineering. And my advisor is Shwetik Patel. And today I'm going to talk with you about uh, my dissertation focus, which is actually partially funded by the Intel um, Science and Technology Center for Pervasive Computing. Um, so my dissertation focuses on how to reliably sense itemized utilities in the home. And this is really an incredibly interdisciplinary topic. Um, it spans embedded computing, machine learning, signal processing, um, information visualization, HCI, big data, behavior change, you know, even mechanical engineering. And so today I'm going to focus on the sensing side of that, um, but it's not just about the sensing, it's really about what you can do with this sensing. Um, and that includes things like policy making, the smart grid, um, behavior change through eco-feedback. And so I was really intrigued by the, uh, the I for Energy mission statement, which was you know, to advance information technology to achieve dramatic improvements in the energy grid, um, energy efficiency, and our decision making in using energy. Um, so, especially since the per capita electricity usage um, in the U.S. is about 40 kilowatt hours per person per day. Um, this number fluctuates just a little bit depending on what year you look at it. Um, but this trumps nearly every other developed country in the world, right? And there's a number of reasons that this is true, not all of them that we have direct control over. Um, but I think there's a recognition, especially probably by the people in this room, this community, um, that we can do better. And I would argue... Um, that it's not just about electricity. The United States is the number one consumer of natural gas in the world. Um, our per capita water use is three to four times almost any country in Europe. Um, and it's really a spiraling effect. Um, if you think about it, it takes water to get electricity, and it takes electricity to get water, right? So water needs to be treated, pumped, um, and then wastewater needs to be pumped back out, possibly treated again. Um, in a municipality, um, a, a lot of different municipalities, that's actually the main source of electricity usage, is actually the, the water infrastructure. And the main source of fresh water usage is thermoelectric power generation. Right, so the utilities are inextricably, they're coupled together. Um, but that's not necessarily bad news, right? I mean, it's a reduction in our water use can spur reductions in electricity and vice versa. Right, so we really have a wonderful incentive to use less water, less electricity, and less natural gas because they'll all feed off of each other and we get dramatic reductions. And I think there's a number of ways to do this, um, most of which are in the mission statement for the you know, I for Energy. You're smarter and more efficient infrastructure with better demand strategies, uh, more informed public policy that regulates and uses incentives properly, um, and for consumers to be more aware about what they're using, to be more efficient about their own um, resource usage. And this is where sensing the end uses of gas and electricity and water is particularly important, right? Because if you want to make public policy, then you want to know how people are using these resources. If you want to reduce your own wasteful practices, you need to be more aware about what your behaviors are so that you can stop reducing, you know, actually be more efficient about your, your resource usage. You want to know things like your pool pump consumes 31% of all of the electricity in your home or that your DVR consumes 11% of all the electricity in your home. You want to know things um, about the water infrastructure, like you want to know that the shower is consuming 60 gallons of water a day and that the toilet is close to 80 gallons. Right? But how do you get this information? Right? How can we make it cheap and easy to install for people? 
Now, one method um, which is actually used here in this very building, as I, I just found out, is to install a, you know, a distributed network of sensors. Right? So for each appliance, um, or at least you know, subsets of appliance or subsets of electrical outlets, um, you install a sensor at every SQL endpoint. Right? And um, this gets expensive. Um, it, it doesn't work in, in all situations. If you want to retrofit a home, this is actually very expensive for a homeowner. It may require professional installation. Um, it could actually, uh, you might need battery replacement from time to time. And so it has some real drawbacks for how scalable this approach can actually be. So instead, there's, there's actually a number of infrastructures that are already in the home, and they're already interconnected with one another. So the electrical infrastructure connects every outlet in the home in one way or another. Um, the plumbing system has branch lines of hot and cold water that are also connected together in one way or another through a tankless water heater or through a water heater. And the gas lines all branch out from the regulator. So it's possible to actually connect one sensor on each infrastructure and look at how noise manifests on these different systems when we're using electricity or water and gas. So at that single sensing point, we want to look at what um, all of our resource usage looks like throughout the home. And so that's actually what I'm going to talk to you about today. You know, what can a single sensor infer about a space from each of these infrastructures? Um, and for the sake of time, I'm really only going to give an overview of our, our gas, electricity, and water systems. Um, I want to keep the discussion fairly high level so that we can cover enough ground. Um, and I do want to mention that uh, GasSense is actually led by a colleague of mine, Gabe Cohn, and ElectroSense, the electricity infrastructure, is actually led by my colleague, Sadak Gupta, at the University of Washington. Um, and the water sensing, HydroSense, is actually the main thrust of my dissertation. Um, so let's start with GasSense. Um, Natural gas is, is only used by a small number of appliances in a home, uh, if at all. You know, typically, we have stoves, um, furnaces, the water heater, uh, fireplace. You know, if, you're, if you're lucky, you might have a pool heater. Um, but it's mostly automated systems. Um, and if you want to sense gas usage in the home, it's, it's actually really challenging. Right? If you think about it, with water and electricity, Getting access to the infrastructure is the easy part. It's very easy to plug something into the wall or you know, attach something to the plumbing line. But with a gas line, there's one golden rule. You don't mess with it, right? You don't want to try to install anything on the gas line or require people to disconnect any part of the gas line, right? So if we don't want to disconnect the lines, we're actually left with one kind of install point, you know, out at the regulator right by the gas meter. Um, and we want to sense the gas usage indirectly, so we need to understand a little bit about how a regulator works. Um, so bear with me on this one. So the regulator consists of a, a, a diaphragm with a spring-loaded case that controls the amount of gas flow that comes in. And as an added safety feature, um, there's these relief valves that exist to vent gas harmlessly you know, into the environment if the line becomes overpressurized. And that relief valve is connected to the diaphragm. Um, and it expels the gas through the relief vent in, the, in the, you know, the unlikely occasion that there is a spike. So one of the first things that we tried was, you know, when you turn on and off gas usage, you actually kind of generate some back pressure um, in, in, in the system. And so we've, we thought that perhaps there would actually be some trace amounts of methane or probably that, that get um, spawned into the environment. And so that was the first thing we tried. It turned out that it wasn't um, all of that useful because most of the time the gas isn't actually coming out of the relief valve. It only, it only gets used in emergencies. But one thing that we did notice is that whenever the gas was being used, the regulator actually began to hiss. Right? And when we look at this further, what we found is that while the gas is flowing, the diaphragm opens partially and allows gas to enter the home through a fixed orifice. And so the phenomenon is actually identical to a whistle. Right? So the size of the orifice determines um, the frequency of that hiss that we can hear, and the flow rate um, is actually linearly proportional to the intensity of the hiss. Right? And so that's ideally suited for measurement using a microphone. Right? So we, we created a sensor mount um, connecting a standard 10 cent electric microphone near the relief vent, um, not completely occluding the vent, but it, it was installed there. Um, and when we did that, we actually um, we can look at what that signal looks like from the microphone when it's installed in that point. And so this is a spectrogram, which is showing the, the frequency content on the vertical axis of the content. Um, and then um, it's also showing that over time here on the, on the horizontal axis. Um, and a number of sounds you can see are, are present in the environment, like wind, cars, and an airplane. But also notice that 
when the stove is turned on, there's an intense signal right at 8 kilohertz, right? And it's that whistling hiss that we'd heard. So what we can do is we can isolate this specific frequency and we can graph it over time. So I'll do that here and annotate it. Um, this is what we get. Um, again, this is just the amplitude of that 8 kilohertz signal graphed over time. And it seems to be highly related to the flow rate of gas that goes into the house. All right, it actually appears to be actually quite linear with flow rate. You know, for example, the, the furnace is uh, a bigger step than the water heater, which is a bigger step than the stove, and so on. And so to see how linear that flow rate was with the audio intensity that we were seeing, we ran a number of appliances with a known gas rating, and we also observed the flow rate from the gas meter. Um, and if we graphed out those meter readings um, versus the actual audio intensity, we get these graphs. One where we, we've graphed it just using um, readings that we had from the gas meter, and just if we use readings from the rated um, usage of that appliance. Right? And uh, I've actually graphed this here in, in CCS per hour, which is a measure of flow rate for gas. And we're able to show that, you know, whether you use, you know, whatever rating system you actually use, whether you're using the appliances or gas meter, you actually get about the same scale factor, about 1.5. All right, so linearity actually makes this very, very easy to calibrate the system. We multiply you know, this one and a half scale factor times the amplitude of that eight kilohertz signal, and we can get the instantaneous flow rate of gas in the home. Um, but we still wanted to build a, a classifier, right, that could distinguish between the different appliances that were being used in the home. And so to do this, what we did was we actually segmented out all of the step changes um, that we saw in the signal. And then we extract two features, um, the slope of the activation, which basically measures how quickly the device opens the valve, um, and the magnitude of the step change, right? So how much gas that appliance is actually using. And since there's only you know, about six appliance types that we need to disaggregate, um, we put this through a, a k-nearest neighbor classifier with k equal to three. And this basically classifies the appliance according to the closest examples that we've seen in our calibration procedure. Um, and we're just using the Euclidean distance in the feature space. I'm not going to go into it in depth. Um, so we wanted to evaluate this approach. Um, so actually, we, uh, my colleague Gabe, he, he collected staged events from nine different homes uh, where he manually went in and, and activated these different gas-consuming devices. Um, and in all, he collected about 500 different trials from six different types of appliances. And two-thirds of those trials were actually collected while more than one gas appliance was running in the home. Um, so that's what we term a compound event. And so if you use tenfold cross-validation, you train up a model for each home, you can actually get a mean accuracy of about 95% in, in telling which gas appliance is on. Um, but if you want to use a minimal calibration approach where you only use a few examples, so a tenfold cross-validation uses a lot of training. Um, so if you only have a few examples of what each um, gas appliance usage, you can still be about 87% accurate, a mean accuracy, with a minimal calibration. And so because there's a small number of appliances, we think that the minimal calibration approach is really low overhead for something for the um, homeowner to be able to do. They could walk around with a user interface and say, oh, I've just you know, turned on the stove, or I'm about to turn on the water heater, or use hot water. Um, and you can actually calibrate this approach using some of our other infrastructure technologies. Um, so I hope that that actually gives you kind of an overview of how we use single point sensing to infer appliance usage. Um, and now that we kind of have a flavor about how that can be done, I actually want to switch modes a little bit and talk about electricity. All right, so this is a slightly more difficult problem because there, there's a lot of different devices to classify. We're not just limited to the six gas usage devices. Um, so electrosense is made to sense a specific class of devices which operate um, from a switch mode power supply, or devices that have some type of electrical switching circuitry while they operate. So a complex fluorescent light bulb, or CFL, would fit into that kind of class of device. And the way that they work is by um, storing energy um, in an inductor, and then switching on and off um, a, that, uh, uh, the voltage to a load so that they can control the voltage that's delivered to the load. Right? So this is actually a very efficient means um, because the heat loss that's generated in this is, is, is much less than you would get in a linear regulator. Um, but this switching, even though it's efficient, it also generates high frequency electromagnetic interference, or EMI. And that gets conducted onto the power line. 
right? So the power line or the, the power supply here, this SMPS, is, is actually just an oscillator that's collect, connected to the electrical infrastructure. And so it's like a radio transmitter, and the, the entire um, electrical infrastructure that it's connected to is one giant antenna. And so when you turn on a CFL, for example, that EMI is conducted back onto the power line. And because the electrical lines in the home are connected to, to each other in one way or another, you can observe that EMI from any outlet in the home. You can see that that CFL was turned on downstairs from an upstairs outlet. It really doesn't matter where you plug in your device. Right? And I'm not just talking about CFLs. Most of electronic devices in your home generate EMI. So TVs, computers, phone chargers, anything that has some type of DC converter in it. Right? And these are really becoming more and more prevalent in people's homes. So if you want to detect this noise, you need a power line interface that's connected to any electrical outlet in the home. And that power line interface is really just something that's, that's made for filtering out 60 hertz. We're interested in EMI that's generated at about 40 kilohertz above or so. So in our case, this is just a high pass filter um, with a corner frequency of about 37 kilohertz. Um, we then digitize this signal and convert the signal into the frequency domain using the FFT, or the Fourier transform. And this is really similar to what we did in the gas sex system, um, except that the incoming signal is voltage instead of sound, and it's sampled at a higher data rate. So we use this frequency data to segment and classify the, the different devices. And what I'm actually going to show you now is, 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 is a, a video of my colleague. And he's going to be going around in the apartment, and he's going to be turning on and off some, some devices. Right? And in the top right, you'll, you'll see the spectrogram that we talked about before. Um, it's just a series of those FFTs over time. And now time is going to be on the vertical axis and frequency on the horizontal axis. Um, so what we'll see here is he's going to walk over to the CFL lamp that's plugged in. And when he turns it off, we actually see that the signature that we have from the spectrogram turns off. He'll turn the TV off. It takes it just a second to shut down. And then we'll actually see the TV turn off. And if he goes and turns another CFL on in the home, it actually generates an, um, a different frequency. It starts generating that EMI. So let's take a closer look at that EMI. Um, so here I'm just highlighting two devices from the spectrogram, one from a PC um, that's on the entire time, and one from a lamp which is on for a few seconds. Now, each device has a consistent frequency at which it operates at. Uh, and that's determined by the frequency inside the circuitry that it's oscillating at. Right? And the noise is continuously generated while the device is on. You know, and each of the resonances that we see from different devices exhibit slightly different characteristics depending on the device. Right? So let's take a closer look at that spectrogram. Um, and what are we going to do is I'm just going to look at one particular slice of the spectrogram. So here is just one time period and the frequency. Uh, the, the energy in the signal across frequency. And what we can see here is that the PC um, actually resonates at about 52 kilohertz. It has a bandwidth of about 2 kilohertz and an amplitude um, that's a lot stronger than that of the lamp. And then the lamp resonates at about 104 kilohertz, has a smaller bandwidth and, and less energy. And it turns out that these three features, the center frequency, bandwidth, amplitude, are actually sufficient for characterizing the EMI that's generated by a number of different devices. So what we actually do is we, we take these three features for each peak that we have extracted. And again, we, we, we put those through a nearest neighbor classifier. And they're robust enough that that nearest neighbor classifier actually performs fairly well. It's very similar to the gas sense approach, um, where we're using Euclidean distance in, in our feature space. And so if we want to look at the evaluation of how, of how this actually works, um, you can actually see that uh, my colleague, he, he chose seven homes, and he set up staged experiments in these seven different homes. Um, so he would go in, and he would have the homeowners turn on and off their devices as they normally would. So he would tell them, you know, please turn your entertainment center on as you normally would. So they would go in, turn their TV or DVD player, cable box, however they did it. And then he would write down and, and segment out exactly what those looked like. In all, he collected um, about 2,500 um, different electrical events. Right? And there were 10 to 20 devices per home that he was actually looking at. Um, and using this approach, he trained a classifier for each home and was able to get a mean accuracy of about 94%, um, which has actually surprised us um, that it did so well right off the bat. Um, but that was with using tenfold cross-validation. So if he used a few examples per home or per 
per device that's in each home, he was able to get an accuracy that was still right at about that 90% level with the minimal calibration. Right? And, and this is really only half the story. Right? There's a number of devices in the home that don't generate this EMI. Um, things like the refrigerator, space heaters, and appliances that you know, typically use a large amount of current. So we're currently actually looking at combining the system with a device that allows you to track the electrical current that's flowing in the home. Um, so this is a, a, a stick-on current meter that our lab's been working on. And it allows you to look at the current that's flowing into the home just by taking this and, and sticking it on the outside of your breaker panel. And combining that with the Electrosense system allows you to sense just about any electrical device um, in the home that you can think of and also tell you exactly how much energy is being consumed by that device if we've disaggregated it before with you know, the, the switch mode power supply. Um, and really, you know, it, it also helps to inform the design of a semi-supervised system that doesn't require any labeled data from the homeowner. And that's helpful for scaling the system you know, to, to many different homes. So my colleague Sadat is really working on a number of algorithms for detecting the type of device um, that we're looking at based on its current profile, and then also based on its continuous noise signature, the pattern of that noise signature that we see over time. So going just beyond actually just looking at the, the resonances and the bandwidths that we have. Um, and I'm gonna come back to electricity at the end of this talk. Um, but we still have one more infrastructure to talk about, um, which is the focus of, of my dissertation, and that's water. And water turns out to be one of the, the biggest challenges for us for, for single point sensing. Um, so, our goal with water sensing is to detect the amount of water flow from each fixture in a home from a single point. Um, but we actually want to detect the amount of hot and cold water. Right? It's important to understand you know, some of the energy implications of, of hot water use versus cold water usage. Um, and so the way that we, that we sense the water usage is through pressure. And this works because the home is a closed pressure system. So when no water is flowing, the entire home sits at a stable pressure. Um, and that's why when you open a faucet, you don't have to wait for the water to come out. You know, it doesn't have to flow down the pipe. It's, it's, it's under pressure, and so when you, you open that up, the water immediately comes out. And so we can attach a pressure sensor um, really anywhere on the plumbing system, and we can observe how that pressure fluctuates when you turn on or off a fixture in the home. So let me look at an example here. Um, when no water is flowing, the pressure remains fairly constant in a home, but when, say, the kitchen sink is activated, we see a pressure drop in the system, and a pressure wave is generated. Right? So this is typically called water hammer. Um, and you might actually have heard this rattling the pipes in your home if, if you turn on some, some really high usage devices, some high usage um, water appliances. And we can extract a number of features from this pressure wave, right? such as um, the, the uh, amplitude that we see. We can look at the pressure drop, which is actually related to the flow rate at which the valve is operating at. Um, we can also look at the frequency content of the wave. Um, so if I zoom into it here, we can look at the max frequency we see. Maybe it's 15 hertz. Um, and we can look at, say, it dies off after about 200 milliseconds. Right? These are features that actually have to do with where in the plumbing system the, the actual um, appliance or device is located. Um, and so we use a number of different features to actually characterize the pressure wave. I'm not going to go over each of them here. We actually use 28. Um, the key intuition is that the fixture looks different in the home depending on its flow rate and location. So a kitchen sink looks different than a toilet, looks different than a toilet that's located somewhere, some other location in the home. Right? And it's also you know, uh, that cold water usage looks different than hot water usage because the pathway back to our sensor is different. It has to go through the hot water heater or it has to go through a tankless water heater. And so cold water and hot water actually look different from each other. So we can compile these into a feature vector, or color here representing the value. Um, and what we can actually see is that most of the time, water usage doesn't just happen in isolation. Right? Water usage usually comes in clusters. We use a lot of water at one time and then maybe not for, not for a while. And so what we can do is, is actually compile this into a sequence of, of, of pressure waves. Right? And, we, and we can also add features into, into these vectors that have to do with the relationship between the pressure waves. Right? Things that have to do with the, our behavior around the way we use water. So the duration of usage that we have, whether or not we think that this is a compound event, um, and, and an array of things like uh, the time of day that this is being used at, the volume that we, that we estimate that you've been using. 
right? And we can classify now a sequence of water pressure waves. And we actually use a common classifier that's used in speech recognition and natural language processing, um, which is a conditional random field. Now, I'm not going to go into a lot of the details here. Um, if you're not familiar with a, a, a CRF, it's, it's very, very similar to a hidden Markov model, except it's slightly better suited for classification in our application. Um, and so if we use the CRS to classify a sequence, what we can see here is that actually, well, this was the kitchen sink being used twice in conjunction with someone um, actually using the bathroom sink and the toilet in the restroom. And so because we're classifying a sequence here, we're actually using algorithms that leverage human behavior. And so we need a method to evaluate this system, which also allows for the water usage to be used naturally. So we can't really use staged experiments anymore to evaluate this kind of a system. So what we did is we set out to create a really large labeled data set. So we installed our HydroSense system in 15 different homes. And along with the HydroSense system, we also installed a number of ground truth sensors um, that were monitoring um, the water consumed by each device in the home. Um, so our data set that we're collecting contains natural water use, real people in real homes and their real routines. And our network of sensors, actually, it's just an array of a lot of different sensors. So we have accelerometers, reed switches, thermistors, power meters, power meters, and they're all designed to tell us when a fixture was activated and whether the water draw was hot, cold, or mixed. And so um, the deployment that we actually did, here's a subset of some of the sinks that we actually instrumented. So here's, um, you'll see, there's actually a, a variety of different sinks that you'll find in people's homes. So, uh, single handle sinks, we used an accelerometer to tell us about what flow rate and whether they were using hot or cold. Um, we used magnets that were next to um, other uh, reed switches and Hall effect sensors so that we could tell you know, how far you'd actually turned um, something on a, a two handle sink. Um, we instrumented the lever valve on, on, on toilets. Um, in the showers, we, we instrumented both the hot and cold lines and also the diverter valve. Right? We needed to know whether this was going into the bath or going into the shower because that relates to flow rate. Um, we needed to know whether you were using if you had a sprayer. Right? So that was instrumented as well, usually with um, reed switches. So we knew whether you had picked it up and it was clicked on. Um, for dishwashers and washing machines, we actually connected a power meter, which you can see right up here, which should tell us when it was actually drawing current. And uh, you can't really see it all that well, but we have a thermistor that's tied to the drain valve. Right, which tells us whether you would use the cold-cold cycle, hot-cold, or maybe a hot-hot cycle. So we knew the temperature of that usage. And we instrumented everything in the home right down to the refrigerator water dispenser. Anything that used water, we instrumented. Um, and so at the end of the day, um, we left this installed for you know, four to five weeks, depending on the home that was in. And we collected about 15,000 um, water usage pressure waves um, that were labeled so that we could evaluate our system. And interestingly enough, there, there were about 100 water, draw, uh, water draws um, per home, per day. Um, and one-fifth of the draws were actually while another fixture was being used, so that compound event, right? So people actually were using water in clusters 20% of the time. And so let's look at the results of, you know, if we run that conditional random field on this data set. And we're going to look at the results of three different granularities. So the first granularity is just the fixture category level. So we want to know that a faucet is being used, not necessarily which faucet, or a toilet. And if we do that and we train up a model, we can actually get an accuracy of, of right around a mean accuracy of 95% done determining which type of water fixture you've, you've got on at any time in the home. Um, we can also look at the fixture level. So for example, that we want to know the exact type of fixture and where the fixture is located in the home, so the upstairs bathroom faucet. Um, and if we do that, we can train up models and actually get us right to about that 92% level, so still doing well. Um, and then the hardest time is, is actually the valve level. So we want to know um, if it's using hot water, cold water, mixed, and exactly which fixture that water is coming out of. And we actually get a little bit of a drop there. It's actually still doing fairly well um, at 80%. Um, but remember, as kind of a common theme here, this is tenfold cross-validation. Right? That's a lot of training data that we had. Remember, we had 15,000 water usage events. If you divide that by 10, that's still a lot of training data that you're requiring people to use. And so I want to quickly look at the minimal calibration scenario. And specifically, I want to break down the results um, based on the number of days of training data that we required to actually get those accuracies. And I'm going to look at the valve level accuracy, which was 80%. 
Um, and if, what we see here is that the training actually has a, a pretty slow ramp up, right? So with this amount of training data, what we're actually asking people to do is, is to label you know, more than 300 events in their home, 500, 7, almost 1,000 events, and we're still nowhere near that 80% that we, that we wanted to get at, the accuracy that we got with the tenfold cross-validation. And the valve level, I'm showing this here because it's worst case scenario, right? It requires a lot of calibration data, but it hammers a point home. We really need a semi-supervised approach to make this practical, right? Which right now is, is, is future work for us. It's something that we're working on. And there's a number of ways of doing this. Um, traditional approaches like expectation maximization and, and incorporating that with hidden Markov models. But I actually want to close the talk by speaking about approaches which leverage a combined electricity and water system to create a semi-supervised approach. And so what we can do is, if we look at the pressure signal, you know, we, we might think that we're seeing bathroom sink activity. And we can actually verify that by looking at the electrical system and say, are the, are the bathroom lights on, right? Um, or you know, we can verify that a certain signal is a washing machine by looking at its pressure signal and the power draw that's happening in the home. So here's two plots, um, one of the pressure signal on top um, over time and the power draw on bottom. And this is actually someone running a load from their, from their washing machine. Um, and so here, you know, both of the features that we can extract from these two streams um, really actually give us kind of an unmistakable signature of a washing machine that we see here. We see the cyclic operation that happens in the pressure line along with an increase in the water usage that also actually kind of correlates very well with the spin cycles. And we can actually begin to infer that this was a washing machine to train up not only our electricity, but also our water usage um, infrastructures. And in the same way, you know, we can look at the power draw to verify that we're seeing a dishwasher cycling. Right? So here's the dishwasher cycling here. We can correspond that with water usage that you see above. And not only that, but we can tell whether or not you use a heated dry on the dishwasher. Um, and it also tells us something where we can attribute other usages to different behaviors in the home. Right? So this is a cluster of water activity that happens right before the dishwasher is turned on. But it isn't just kitchen sink usage. It's someone rinsing dishes. Right? So now we can associate a behavior with that. So it's not just that the kitchen sink uses this much. It's that you use this much water while you were washing dishes. Um, in the same way, this isn't just someone um, using water at 7.30 in the morning. It's someone making coffee. They're filling the coffee pot and the coffee pot running. Right? So we can begin to break down this electricity and water usage, by the specific behaviors that are surrounding them. You know, we can even tell when the water usage isn't really a human at all. Right? So here's where the human uses the bathroom sink usage. Um, and here's the leaky flapper valve. Right? So this is a leak in your home, right? which is billions and billions of gallons of water per year. Um, if you aggregate across the entire United States, not just in your home. Um, and so really, that's, that's kind of where I want to conclude. You know, I, I presented our work on, on, on building and evaluating these single point disaggregated sensing systems for gas, electricity, and water. Um, and I also described the challenges with each of these approaches and why we're moving towards this combined semi-supervised approach to make it practical. And finally, I, I hope that I also showed the richness of combining these two systems together, possibly even being able to attribute you know, the usages of different activities and behaviors in the home um, to the specific points where you're using um, gas, electricity, or water. And you know, thank you for your time, and I'd be happy to take questions or comments. One thing I, that I do want to say here is that um, I want to recognize my collaborators, especially Gabe Cohn, Sadak Gupta, and then also um, John Freilich, who John and I actually built the HydroSense system from the ground up over the past three years or so. And he's actually, he just started on as a professor at the University of Maryland. So uh, I do want to, uh, to, to mention John in this talk as well. It's not just me. Um, but thank you very much. And I'd be happy to take questions. Great. Thank you, Eric. OK, we'll start off, Alex. Thank you, Eric. That is very interesting. Could, could you talk a little bit more about what you mean when you say 80% accuracy or 85% accuracy? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so uh, when, I, when I'm talking accuracy, I'm talking in terms of you know, if, if it was actually the kitchen sink that was being used, then we, uh, in our data set, we also um, said that it was the kitchen sink. So, so we, have, you know, we divided our data set into training folds and the testing folds. And so this was the accuracy on, on those testing folds. Um, that we saw. But is, 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 does accuracy mean 
um, the percentage of time that you correctly identify the load or Oh, the, I see. It's the it, percentage of events that we classified correctly. So one water usage event would be a single pressure wave. So there were 15,000 pressure waves. Um, so if we, uh, if we got 10,000 of those right, then we'd be right at you know, about two thirds um, and, accuracy. And the ones that you got wrong were misidentified or were not? These were misidentified, right? And so I've actually got some confusion matrices and, and, and things that, that tell you how those were misclassified. Um, so you know, the most common confusions that we got were um, sinks that were right next to each other. It's kind of the, the his and her sinks. They're the Jack and Jill sinks that um, are in a bathroom just because you know, they're, they're identical fixtures and they're you know, maybe three feet away from each other. Um, and with the, you know, those were actually pretty common for us to, to miss which one was actually consuming water. And then one other personal question. I, back in 2000, I instrumented my house's water pressure during the Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. just to see if it really was true that everybody in the neighborhood flushed the toilets at the same time. <laughs> and one of the things I learned was that my house and one, two, three of the neighbor houses were all on the same regulator. So uh, I would see signatures in my house when my neighbor flushed his toilet. Mm -hmm. And I wondered if you dealt with that at all. Uh, we, we have dealt with that a little bit. It's actually it's less common that you have one regulator over you know, a number of houses. Mm -hmm. Um, but actually, even, even if that does happen, there's usually, or there, it should, if it's up to code, it should have a backflow preventer valve on the outside where the meter is to prevent any, um, it actually stops a lot of those pressures from going back out into the, um, the water main, um, which is where you see some of these events. But it, it does occasionally happen. A lot of times you'll see transients that happen on the water main where they're working on the device or you know, they, they shut off a big thing and you'll see a half an hour transient in the pressure signal that looks like this. If you zoom out, you, you can actually see it. And so it does happen. Um, it's, it's less common in homes. For apartments, it's, it's actually pretty common. And so actually two of the deployments that we had were, were apartments, not homes. Um, and so they, it depends. Older buildings, sure, you, you, can, you can see a lot of that crosstalk. But it also means that you can install some of these sensors at, at one place and now get three people's you know, uh, home usage rather than, than just one. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, we actually we put it in five for the for the for the um, for the longitudinal study for the five week study. So each of the homes we had they had it for four to five weeks. So how much did it cost you to do the ground sense metering of all those devices? Um, it took a lot of time. Oh, okay. So so uh, sorry. So so the question was you know how much um, how much did it actually cost to do the the ground truth um, networking, and it actually. The devices themselves, it, it took us about $2,500 to just get all of the wireless connectivity, but it actually took the manpower that it took is what took, you know, it, that's drastically where a lot of our resources went. You know, so I would get an email every time that a sensor went down. You know, it's like, hey, we haven't heard this sensor for you know, the past five minutes. We didn't get the heartbeat signal. So, I, you know, I would have to call up and, and say, you know, hey, is this malfunctioning? Um, one, of the, one of the easiest things for us to do was actually install lights on the sensors. And so you get used to it. You, you turn the water on and the light comes on. And when it doesn't, you immediately, oh, that sensor's malfunctioning. And so a lot of times we'd have the people, they would know that the sensor was malfunctioning before we did you know, from our heartbeat signal. Um, but it actually, it, it took a lot of time, a lot of effort. It took the better part of two years, really, to get that right. Um, and so that's actually why I would want a system like HydroSense so I don't have to do that kind of ground truth deployment that's there. I, uh, I don't know how much you're prepared to talk about the electrosense, but um, I, there was a slide uh, going quickly past it with a, with a um, uh, circuit breaker box and, and uh, some sensors. I'm interested in what's happening there because uh, we have a project here that's doing that same, just sensing is the current flowing in that, on that switch. Mm -hmm. And, and, and more generally, you might talk about hybrid systems where you have maybe a few wireless sensors placed strategically to give you some more information so you can resolve the, you have more data to resolve the, the, the usage patterns. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, 
so to, to get at your first question, I can, so the two questions. The first one was about um, the, the contactless current sensor that we have. And, um, that's something that, that both Sadat and Schwedek had been working on. Um, for, they've actually got a publication on that, which, which I can point you towards to show exactly you know, how you calibrate it and how well it works. And so they, they've actually defined the bounds on, on that. And so I, I can point you at that, but I don't know them off the top of my head. Um, and then um, as far as for wireless networks, you know, if, if we you know, installed maybe you know, a couple of light sensors or even you know, temperature sensors and kind of put them out the house, you know, could we actually be more accurate? You know, would that be helpful? Um, and I think, I think we could. I think, I think certainly. I mean, you know, um, a lot of times you want point of view sensors, right? So um, one of the things that's really interesting is if you want to look at hot water draw in a home, you want to know how long people are waiting to get hot water. And so just taking a thermistor and, and, and putting that you know, near the, um, the water faucets is there is actually something that's really interesting. It's something that you know, the hot water community is, is, it wants to know about. Um, and so having that kind of array of sensors would, would certainly help with the accuracy. Um, and it's something that, that we haven't looked at yet, but I, I think that, that we could, certainly. You mentioned a few times minimal calibration. Can mm -hmm. you talk more about what that means? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, really that's just, um, you know, what does it take if we, if we, if we have only a few examples? Um, so on the electricity side, it would, it would be, you know, I'll turn my TV on three times, and I have a little interface that says, you know, I turned it on, turned it off, turned it on, turned it off. And using those three examples, how well do we classify it now if we turn it on 15 or 20 times? And so the minimal calibration side is, is, is really, you know, how we see this being practical. Um, um, but also, you know, my, 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 my colleague Sadat is, is, is really working on, you know, semi-supervised approaches um, where, you know, you can look at the pattern of, say, a TV. So the TV will actually fluctuate its frequencies um, depending on the, or the, the brightness of the screen. Um, and so, you know, if you pick up on that, that uh, signature over time, you can actually classify that as a TV, and you have you know a really nice example of that without having to have someone come in and label it. And so, you might have a, you know an array of, of unlabeled events, and if, even if you have you know one or two or three that are labeled, you can actually use the unlabeled events and the labeled events together to inform a lot of the machine learning algorithms that we have. And that's something that's kind of the future work that, um, well, our current work that that we're looking at right now. So the semi-supervised would be using some sort of a database of past events that have been labeled to, yeah, so, to categorize? Right. So one of the things that you know, maybe I, I didn't talk about, it's really easy to extract events. Right. We see a pressure wave, or we see a step change in the gas, or, or you know, something new happens in the spectrogram for the electricity. But it's really tough to get a label for that. Um, you know? uh, and so we can actually build this giant database that, that, that you mentioned of unlabeled events. And if we just have a few labeled ones, that really does help um, inform the design of the machine learning. Yeah. Um, so for gas sense, because I read about the regulator approach, like it was probably like a couple of years ago. So I was wondering if there's more work being done. Um, so we've we're actually working on on building an embedded platform of that. So so instead of um, you know, streaming up something. We're actually working on um, can we can we take this, miniaturize it, put it on something that's really low power, like a an MSP four hundred and thirty, and actually do all of the um, do all of the classification on the embedded device that's there. And so, specifically, we're we're kind of using it. You know, how does it um, interact with our other systems? Um, but as far as you know, do we need to be more accurate with the gas sensing? I think we've kind of hit the threshold of, of you know, how accurate we need to be, given that you know, there's only about six different types of, of gas-consuming um, appliances in the home. Um, and a lot of homes don't even use natural gas. And so it's, it's less used than, than some of our other infrastructure methods. Um, but we still have it kind of on the back burner. Yeah. Oh, OK. It so it's metaphor. still the regulator approach. Not um, Have you tri looked into like other oh, ones, uh, maybe? As far as like other sensing methodologies. Um, right, to just. Um, actually, no, we, we stuck with the microphone. It, it's, it's pretty robust, and it's a really low-cost solution. Um, the only, the only um, kind of hiccup with that is, is, is getting the right regulation so that you can attach to that relief vent um, that's on the gas regulator. So that could be kind of a problematic thing that, that might require us to look at different sensing modalities. But, um, but for the most part, it, it's, it's a pretty robust system, and we, you know, we like the, the low-cost microphone.
Okay. Um, also, for all these systems, um, let's say if you are going to, once you know you get it done and you don't need the ground truth sensors and you are going to deploy it to like 50 or 100 homes, mm -hmm. um, so every home, it would have to, all the events have to be calibrated. Or I was wondering, like, you know, what would it look like if you didn't have to do a calibration? Like, you can actually just, you know, have, you know, be able to generalize the signatures. I, I don't know how. Well yeah, that would look. so I, I didn't include it here. So, so part of my dissertation is, is actually doing just that. Um, so that, that's kind of the last chapter here is um, for at least for the water what makes the water so difficult is that the signatures that we have they don't generalize at all really across the home or at least the features that we can pull out some of the behavior features such as duration of usage and volume used those do generalize and so you know one of the things that I'm looking at is, is actually training up kind of a hierarchy of classifiers so you take some of the features that you expect to generalize you train up a global model um, and you use that to kind of seed some of the other machine learning um, algorithms there so you can get some labeled events and then train those per home models that you really need for the water infrastructure. Um, for the electricity, actually what we've been finding out is that um, that continuous switching is, is almost independent of the home that you're in. So if I take a, you know, an LCD monitor, I plug it in here, um, it gets a signature and if I plug it in in a different home, it has almost the exact same type of signature. And so a lot of the features that we're pulling out on the electricity side do generalize across home, not all of them. Such, you know, bandwidth constraints are really kind of set by the electrical infrastructure that you attach to. Um, but the device itself, it operates at a certain frequency. Um, and so we can really key in on that in, in multiple homes. Oh, great. Yeah, I'd be really interested in seeing the results on the generalization. Yeah. Yeah, it's not good for water, um, but uh, but uh, at least you know we're we're trying to build up from that. Uh, for the electric sense, did you have to uh, deal with signals coming in from from neighbors? Um, actually, we we didn't really see that. It turns out that um, the the breaker panel that was there, and you'll have to excuse me if uh, if I mess this up a little bit because this is really Sadat's main focus. Um, but the breaker panel was was actually pretty good at isolating. So any, any, or any time that you have you know, sub-metering, even in, in an apartment complex, um, that's fairly isolating of the EMI signature that's, that's there that you want to detect. Great, good. Um, but I, I do think you, do, you get some noise um, on the system, um, possibly from, from neighbors, right? which would be in common in an apartment, but maybe not houses. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we, we, I actually did break that down. So I, we break that down in one, in one of the papers that we have. I, did, I didn't show it here. Um, it's about twice as bad when, when compound events are running. Um, and um, without the behavior model of the way that people are using, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's quite a bit worse. Um, so once you put that behavior model on top of it, um, it, uh, it, it starts to get quite a bit better. Um, so you know, our, our error rates for um, you know, some of the isolated events would have been around 7 to 8%. Um, and if those were used in compound, that might actually jump to somewhere around 14% um, error rate. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's also actually, it's, it's, it's interesting because sometimes a com knowing that it's a compound event is actually helpful, right? Because most of the compound events that happen in a home usually revolve around the toilet and bathroom sink. And so that's actually kind of a feature that helps you out a little bit. So it's, it's not like all is lost, but definitely a lot of the, the features that are there change quite a bit and in a nonlinear way. Right. Um, so, so the question was, you know, did, did we actually um, present some of this data to, to people in the home? Um, so actually, um, John Fralick had headed up a, a, a survey of taking this data and actually taking through people through um, someone else's data over time. And so to kind of get their reactions to, okay, the visualization side of this, where if you display a bar graph, um, how does that actually um, affect people's perception of their water usage? Um, you know, do they want to see this water usage? Um, on a social media landscape? Do they want to do competition? Um, do they want to look at their neighbors or, you know, that kind of thing? You know, how do you get people to use um, 
less water, you know, to actually instill some behavior change. And so that's, that's really, you know, John's actually looked at that through, through some surveys. Um, and right now we're actually, as we deploy some of these technologies and we, we get them through that semi-supervised approaches to where we're very happy, they're very easy to calibrate and we can stage these up. I think that's when we're actually, we start pushing into, you know, some of the information design and how behavior change, you know, what percentage reduction can we actually get and how sustained is it? Um, but those are some of the, the, the future research topics that, um, that we're, we're, explore, we're trying to get to as fast as we can. Yeah. Any other questions? Hi. Um, uh, as for the um, electric sense, so what kind of sensor are you using to measure the current for, um, for so I mean, sensing principle in terms mm -hmm. of sensing? Yeah, it's actually, uh, it's just two magnetic field sensors. Um, that are that are outside. Um, I don't know a whole lot about the contactless current sensor, but I, I can actually I can shoot you towards the publication okay. um, that, that Sadat did. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And with that, I think we'll close. Thanks again. Wonderful talk. Yeah. Thank you.